Hey everyone, welcome back to the lab. In this video, we're gonna be building a simple result type in Python. So types are like labels for code paths. They define explicit contracts for what a flow expects and what you can expect in return. Done well, these labels make code easier to understand and maintain at scale, over time, people, and lines of code. But done poorly, they add little information or in extreme cases, make it harder to understand these code paths. And when I think about this, I think there's like really two key differentiators um, that make these labels go wrong, that make them a net negative versus a net positive. The first one is honesty. And this is, is this really the input and outputs? If you say that, you know, a function can return string, but it can really be null, then this is how you lead to breakage. And this is, you know, the billion dollar null pointer exception issue. It's really because the type system is telling you the contract is this, but it's actually slightly different. And now you have breakages everywhere. Also Python does this really any kind of language that has a linter and it's not like compile safe does this, but even a lot of compiled languages have this issue. C sharp had this issue for a long time until they um, built in uh, the null safety flag um, in the newer versions of .NET. Um, so this is actually pretty common for, for languages to not be honest about their types. The next one is precision. So is this type, is this contract narrowing possibilities? If you have a type that says any, but it's only really useful for strings, then this isn't really helping. And I kind of think of this as like that meme where there's like the developer and she has the box with all the different shapes of holes and she gives it to the the unit tester and the person starts putting the shapes into the the holes but then you slowly realize that all shapes can go in the circle hole and so everyone just keeps putting it in the circle hole it's like okay that works but it's not really helping you it's not really doing what it is supposed to and so if you aren't being precise with your types then you're getting all the baggage of types it's just noisier there's like more stuff you have to do but it's not actually helping you do anything and so it just gets in the way and so Python has type hints, but it's still missing a lot of features I would expect of like modern types. And a lot of the documentation kind of available is still written in a dynamic fashion um, without types at all. And so in this post, we're gonna explore, you know, what a result type is, why it's helpful and how to write one in Python to try and get us going towards this, you know, types done well version instead of kind of the default of done poorly. So first let's start off with like why types are important. I have like a ton of different rants about why I think types are, are very important and useful um, for software in general. But here I'll just kind of give like the high level um, thesis, if you will. And really it's that types make contracts explicit. And you know, if you've ever looked at the Zen of Python, right, we want explicit over implicit. So hopefully this vibes with you as well. And so I believe clear, honest types make code easier to understand and maintain at scale. They make the contract of what they support explicit, which allows editors, compilers, code tools, surface contract breakage at code time so you can fix it before you ship the broken thing to prod. And if you've been in any organization for a while, they're always talking about like this idea of shift left. Shift left really just means, can we surface these errors before we ship it to users? And types are a very easy way to do this at scale. But this, you know, doesn't mean that types are like, the panacea, it's not the silver bullet that's gonna solve everything and there's ways to do them wrong such that they cause more problems than, than they help. And I think, you know, the main argument for this or why they can be bad um, is that they are clunky, they lie, and then they just kind of like get in the way, you know? They, they cost more than they're worth. And I think this is true for bad type systems or when misusing good type systems. Um, oftentimes people, in the past have gotten burned by this because they're working in like an enterprise Java or C sharp environment um, and the types aren't very specific. Maybe they're on an old version of the runtime where there's a lot of nulls running around or they've got like layers of like types that are like nine things deep. And so it's impossible to understand what's going through what. And so I think this is valid, it can happen. But I think we have to realize that the way to declare contracts in code and programming and software um, is to use types and so when done well, they allow for simple, precise contract declaration, which can avoid kind of the downsides and kind of like they are the way to declare contracts. So like you need contracts. So you might as well just get good at these um, because they're not going anywhere anyway. Now I do want to say that Python does not have a very good type system. Um, but that doesn't mean it's like a lost cause. We can leverage the constructs it provides to approximate better type systems, but there is kind of like a ceiling for how good we can get um, with the language. And a lot of the mainstream languages today are kind of held back by how they were built um, 
to start with. So we, you know, there's better ways to do this, but in Python, we're gonna, we're gonna do the best we can. Okay, so we've kind of established that types are how we do contracts. Um, and now we're gonna talk about result types and why they matter. And really result types is just a specific type of contract that covers a very common pattern in logic and therefore a common pattern that we are modeling um, in our code. And so most logic is CRUD and we can basically break down almost all logic into two categories. The first is we're going to get data, we're gonna read stuff out and then maybe make a decision on that data. And then we're gonna do stuff with that. And so, you know, in CQRS, maybe this is the query version, this is the command version. And so like super oversimplification, but this is basically it. And if we think about these as like this very simplified form, each of these is gonna return some sort of signal as to what happened. And we almost always have the same kinds of needs and patterns for understanding what happened with a given action. And so the most common one is like, was it successful? We often need to know if something was successful so that we can do something about it. And then if it wasn't successful, why wasn't it successful? Because often we need this extra information to determine what is that thing we need to do to recover. And then usually we evolve from there to like needing extra information because you know the business changes, the use cases changes, maybe we need this thing on the front end. And so often you'll need to evolve it to like have maybe an ID on success or now add a standardized error code um, so that the system can recover, so that the user can reference it in a ticket or something, um, stuff like that. Kind of goes from very simple and starts getting extra features on top. And this is basically how like all, all features kind of evolve in this form. It's a very, very common pattern. And so typically we start off with the very rudimentary return type, we get it working. And then these cases will grow over time. So we add more stuff to it. And so we'll kind of go over how does this look in code um, and then think about what is the system of evolution that we can kind of set up the scaffolding so that we can handle this common pattern much easier going forward. And so here's how this often looks in code. So we're writing you know, our CRUD logic and oftentimes the return type will start off as just none. There just is no return because we just don't need it right now. We're just like, go save widget, go save this thing. And like, we just assume it works. And then, you know, in the worst case it fails and it'll just throw an error and crash the whole system, but it doesn't matter because we're not recovering anyway. Um, and we're just kind of building fast, but like, you know, pretty soon you'll realize that throwing hard doesn't make sense in like most cases, um, because most cases we kind of can expect some error values. Like let's say the user has a form on a web page and they're submitting some information, we can expect the user is gonna send us bad data, right? And so we don't wanna fail hard because maybe we have some logging we wanna do, maybe we have some other things we wanna do at the end. So instead we need to represent that something went wrong. And so the first thing you'll do is you'll just have a bool. You'll just try to save it. And then, you know, if it, if it didn't save correctly, we're just gonna return false. And this is gonna allow your logic to recover. Oh, if it didn't work well, then we're gonna you know, send maybe a nice error message back to the user so that they can know they sent us something bad. Now, pretty soon you'll need some extra information because you know you told the user that they, they sent something bad to your web page, but like the user is dumb. They don't know what they sent badly. They don't know what your logic is expecting because the contract is not explicit. I um, mean, so then you're going to add extra information with maybe a tuple. It'll be a, a maybe a bool of success and then maybe an error message here. And so in this way, you know, you can barely change your backend logic, your validation logic, and then you can send back to the user exactly what they did wrong so that they can change it um, and fix it again. But often this isn't enough either because maybe a form has multiple fields. Maybe it's their name, their street address, their phone number, stuff like that. And if you're only sending them the errors one at a time, they're gonna get annoyed because they've had to retry this thing three times and they're just trying to get the form right. And so often what you do is you'll return now a array of errors and so that we can send back everything that they did wrong all at once so they can fix it in one go and not get annoyed at us. And these patterns are probably familiar. You've probably have versions of these in your own code and you've probably written these, these things dozens of times throughout your career. They are pretty common in Python and in some languages they are the recommended pattern. AKA Golang almost always does tuples of success or error if it exists. Or I guess they're usually success value and then the error if it exists. And so these are common and they are fine and they can work okay, but they are reliant on a lot of implicit logic. Like just for example, if this Boolean is false, then we expect the string to not be none. This isn't explicit here. If you've seen this pattern before, you might expect this, but there is no enforcement about this. We could very easily set bool to true and still have the string not be none. 
And so for simple cases, this is okay, you know, sometimes. But often our system wants to keep evolving. And as we add extra use cases, as we get beyond just two values and we start to get to like five values or eight values, now it becomes much, much harder to keep track of what values are set and when. And so now let's just go from two values that, you know, is success an error message to just three values to kind of show what this combinatorial complexity looks like. And so what if our, we want to return something on success? Let's say on success, we saved whatever it is we're saving and we want to return back an ID so that maybe the front end or, you know, whoever's using this can re reference it later. How does that work in our current system? Well, we might just do something like this. Like we already have a tuple of values. Let's just add a value. And so now it looks like this. And given the context of the evolution above, maybe we can infer what this means. And for reference, this is, you know, success ID and, you know, error string. We have to think about what a random new developer who's coming into this feature, um, maybe they have never touched this code before, um, but they know that they need to change something here. Would they be able to intuit what this means? Would we be able to trust them to come in here, make changes and not make a bug? And the answer is probably not. Like they could probably figure this out by themselves eventually. Maybe we have some good tests. Maybe we have, this is like a common pattern we're using, but we can't trust that they're working within the same pattern because nothing is stopping them from doing the wrong pattern here. So maybe they forget to fill in, you know, the error strings when they, they return an error, or maybe they're just returning IDs when there was an error, or even worse, maybe they're just filling in the wrong values for the wrong thing. Maybe they say, hey, there's only one error and now we're gonna return a list of IDs. These are all possible and nothing's really stopping them from doing this, or even kind of like keeping them on the guardrails that like maybe you shouldn't do this, um, because the type system is allowing this. And now at this point, you might consider just writing your own data class to kind of model this um, outside of Python, usually called a record, and to make these values more explicit and give context of like, what is this value represent? You know, what does tuple position two uh, mean? Is it IDs or is it errors? And this is better, but it still doesn't enforce that the ID only exists on true and errors only on false. And kind of example of what this looks like is, you know, success on or error. This is what we're representing with the tuple. You know, you have a bool of success. The ID is either none or string and then the errors are none or string. But the problem is like none of this is saying that ID only exists on true and errors only exist on false because, you know, we could still get this wrong. And so the idea here of these kind of object oriented factory methods is to do a create success or create error. And then you could say kind of enforce that at least on creation, you're getting this combination correct which is good for data creation. But the problem is downstream readers of this, they don't get that type help. They will still have to implicitly know that on success ID is always string and on not success errors is always, always filled. And so they're gonna have to do their own downstream type checking. That logic is gonna be spread throughout the code base. The type system cannot help them because we are not being precise with what types exist in what cases. Okay, and now on to result types. So result types try to make this very common pattern, this very common scenario of logic modeling and logic evolution easier to both kind of write, use, and enforce. And basically what they say is that a result can either be okay, and it has a type, or error, and that also has a type. And so that makes it easier for the type says to infer what type to expect in a success versus failure case. And thus it can help ensure that whatever contract you've declared is respected both at write time, at creation time, but also read time without having to kind of spread this implicit logic around. And so in this way, we could model a return type something like this. So we could say like, oh, we have a result type. Um, it has a string on success or uh, for failure, it's gonna have a array of string. And then, so if we say, oh, the result is okay, then we know for a fact that the value is string. And if the result is not okay, then we know for a fact it's a list of strings and the type system can help us. And so now we can have that new random dev come in and we can trust that what they're going to write is going to at least fulfill the contract because we've given them, you know, guardrails, a paved road for exactly what this thing is supposed to do. It's very precise. And so this means that we don't get any null pointer exceptions because, you know, we're not spreading around that like, oh, if success is true, then now I can just kind of blindly grab the ID field because the type system knows what types it can infer and it can enforce that. And so if you do the bad thing, you try to grab errors on success, it'll be like, hey, sorry, this is none. Uh, this, this just doesn't exist. You can't do that. And so this is great. You know, this is very honest. This is very precise. And this is how we can kind of push Python's you know, relatively rudimentary type system towards a better type system to try and make our logic more enforceable, more clear, um, 
and really prevent those, you know, bugs and errors from actually reaching prod. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense and why results are useful and the kind of common patterns that they can help us out with. Now we're gonna move on to building a simple result type in Python. And I'll show you some code examples as well. Now, first off, you might not want to build your own result type. Um, rolling your own stuff can be fun and adds customizability, but often it's better to just use a battle hardened one from the community and move on with your life. I personally like rested pi slash result, um, which is linked here. And this is its uh, little GitHub repo thing. It's used quite a lot um, and has had like, you know, a lot of updates here. So I think it's pretty, pretty good, pretty battle hardened, covers like the basic use cases. So if you can pull in a third party app, then I would, you know, recommend just grabbing this one. That said, there are some times where pulling in third party libraries to do things just doesn't make sense. You know, maybe third party party libraries are just not allowed um, in your organization or in your code base, or maybe there's like a lengthy approval process that you don't want to go through, or maybe you just don't want the baggage that goes along with it. Um, often these third party libraries have other kind of crud just kind of in there that maybe you don't want for a very simple functionality like this one. And so I think there are many reasons why this might be true for your, your use case. And you know, this is what happened to my use case. We have a pretty lengthy approval process. Um, they gotta like look at the package, make sure there's no security concerns, all sorts of things. And it's like, I just want a simple result type. I don't wanna go through that. Um, so I just decided to write my own, uh, taking kind of the best parts of these result packages and making it very simple so that there's like really no risk involved. So that's what we're doing here. It's a very simple version of a result type that you can kind of copy and paste um, without any of the other baggage. And so I have the code here. Um, if you want to look at it, copy, paste it. Um, but I also have it available in Replit, and we're going to go over there so that we can run it and get some syntax highlighting and stuff like that. All right, so here we are in Replit, and I've got my simple result type. And so let us start with kind of going over the definitions, and then we will go into the test code to kind of prove it works and give you examples of how it works. And so the first thing we're doing here is we are declaring two type vars and you know, Python type system, very rudimentary. And so this is how we can approximate generics and basically say, these things are a specific type. We don't know what this type is, but this is how you can kind of reference what this type is and know it's the same thing um, throughout flowing through it. it. It really is a variable for types. Um, this is very unusual. <laughs> Most programming languages don't have to do this stuff, but again, Python's core, type system not good so they have to do this like weird stuff and so tok is basically the generic for our okay type and t error is the um, generic for our error type and then so for our class okay we're saying hey um, this is going to be a generic and it's going to take in that tok type and then so when we create okay um, it's taking in a value of type tok it's saving it to itself and then we're going to give it two functions is okay it's just going to be a bool so that you can kind of have a great easy way of checking is this the okay or error? We won't actually be using this um, in code, but I just wanted to provide this um, in case you wanted to do this. And then okay value is how you actually access the value on the okay type. And you can see here that it's returning to okay. And this is how we're hinting at the type system that this value comes in and it flows out. Error is exactly the same, um, except for two things. One, it's only taking in the T error type, and this will be useful for our discriminated union on TOK T error, as I'll show you in a minute. And it has error value instead, um, which also returns type T error. And then finally, it has is okay, but it's gonna return false because this is not okay, this is the error. Okay, and how do we put these together so that we know that like it's either okay or error? Here we are using a union type, um, and we are aliasing it to simple result. And so this is actually the type you would, you would use. Um, and then you can represent what is the type on okay and what is the type on error. So that's the definition. Um, probably hard to follow here. So let's look at like how is it actually used um, and hopefully that makes it a bit clearer. So here's our tests. And basically what we have is a little helper here where we're gonna call create result with true or false um, and then a message. Um, if it should be okay, then we're gonna return the okay type. And if it should be false, we're gonna do an error type with the message and obviously very contrived, but it should be easy to see how um, we can make any kind of function return either a success or failure with a payload specific to it. Um, for our case, we're being very simple, but kind of showing how you can discriminate between two strings. So, you know, without result, it would just be string, but actually the strings mean something. And here we are saying that we can have okay strings or error strings. And in our definition, you can see how this would flow into the T okay, and this would um, refer, flow into the T error uh, type variables. All right, so now we have two um, tests, and I'm just gonna run this to kind of prove what this does. Um, so we can 
look at both. And so the first test is um, test OK. And so what we're doing is we're just creating a message that we're going to use for this OK type. And then we're creating a result with our helper here. And then we're going to assert a bunch of things and then print out. And so we can see that OK value here. This is the OK object. And when we grab this, it is returning the message we sent in. So we know this is working. But I want to show you, like, how does this look actually in code? Because I think this is really the big unlock for us. And so the way that you're going to discriminate between these values is by using is instance. Um, again, this is just because Python, not very smart. It really only understands um, type narrowing via this is instance type. And so that's what we have to, to um, use to discriminate. And right now, this doesn't look that like, useful. But if I try to move this up here, and access OK value, which only exists on OK before we've done the instance narrowing, we can see that the, the type checker is not letting me do this because it knows that actually this value at this point in time can be an OK or an error. And so me trying to access the OK value is not allowed um, because it might not actually exist. And yet down here, we know that this is OK. And this is because I've already narrowed this type to OK by using this is instance. And so after this check, um, this check now becomes uh, type safe. And so you can see here, no error. And so that's the power of this is we are now able to just use this very simple is instance to differentiate between these two different string types. And you can imagine for much more complex combinations of values on OK or error, this becomes very useful. And the, the next one is just test error, and it's doing the exact same thing, but just on error message. And again, if you want to play around with this, you can uh, check it out in the replet here and fork it next. So Python still doesn't really have a very good type system, but there are ways to make it just a bit nicer to work with. And hopefully this helps you make your contract simpler and more precise to make coding easier, more fun, and with less bugs. And I think really most of the modern kind of mainstream languages, they just do this badly. Like C Sharp doesn't even have a union type yet, so it's not doing this very well. Java, I think, actually is kind of getting this with like switch statements. Um, Python doesn't really support this, so we kind of have to build our own versions and use is instance. It's kind of clunky. Golang doesn't have any version of um, these sum types. And so it's really hard to like make this very precise logic in a lot of the languages we're using today. So we kind of have to build our own constructs on top of them until they you know, get smarter and, and then actually uh, build that into their core. Now, I was introduced to the world of modern precise types via F Sharp. It does things differently than most languages, but I think it does reveal a lot about what programming could be and how a lot of these languages are not really living up to their potential. They're still kind of stuck in their legacy ways of how they were built like 30 years ago, even though the science um, has kind of evolved way past them and showing what we can do to make logic easier and kind of fix a lot of the very common patterns and bugs um, that exist in modern software. Now, if you're interested in learning about F Sharp, here's some resources to get you started. Question for you is how are you representing success and failure in your Python code, um, especially ways that are like simple but kind of maintainable and hopefully play nicely with the type checker so we can kind of shift left and keep more of those bugs out of prod. If you like this post, you might also like how I got interested in F Sharp kind of my journey through several different languages before landing on F-sharp is a nice um, balance between a lot of the things I enjoyed while also getting rid of a lot of the things I didn't. Might also be interested in Python data class best practices and why you should use them. And finally, uh, a brief comparison of modern programming languages, TypeScript, Golang, Elixir, Rust, and F-sharp. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.